We're starting a very uh, brand new series today called Skeptic. Um, the whole idea behind this series is that we would explore some questions of, of things that come up against Christianity and, and faith and, and our beliefs and religion as a whole. And the next few weeks possibly will be a little different than what we're normally used to. I might talk a little differently than what we would normally have. Um, I might teach a little more than preach, and maybe I'll preach a little more than I teach. I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, we're all in this together. So um, the whole idea is that, that we attack some of these questions that come up against religion and Christianity and faith and things that come up in our life. And, and maybe there are things that you have thought about before. Maybe there are things that you um, are currently struggling with. Maybe there are things that you have never in your entire life thought of. Um, I'm going to put some questions in your head. Uh, and the whole idea is that, that maybe us as a corporate body can look at some of these ideas and some of these questions and and know how to handle them in the future when they potentially come up in our life. And while we can't peel off every question that, that comes up against our faith, it would take us years and years to do. I think it's important for us as a corporate body to look at some of these questions and, and um, kind of figure out what God has to say about them, what scripture has to say about them. Questioning is, is a very important part. And, and today I want to focus in on our faith, and, and even more so how faith lines up and how faith counters science. Okay, we live in a world where science is king right now. Um, and I think it's important for us to compare the two and know how they are. I don't know how you grew up. For me, I grew up in a, in a Christian home. Um, I grew up in a Christian home in the Midwest. And if you grew up in a Christian home in the Midwest, you go to church, right? And it's not like you, just, you attend church. Like in the Midwest, you go to church, okay? You guys get off easy. You literally have to come here for four hours and 20 minutes a month, okay? <laughs> for me, we went four hours and 20 minutes a day. Like, that was just the thing. And then for me, I grew up in a pastor's home. So when you grow up in a pastor's home in the Midwest, it's like this double dose of, of God's grace. Um, so for me, I grew up just infinitely being pounded with faith. And, and from day one in my life, faith was being poured in. My parents were pouring it in. We were constantly in church, and, and I was raised on this stuff. And, and I never had to question anything because I had people constantly pouring it in. We went to, we went to Sunday school at 9 o'clock. We went to church at 10 o'clock. We went back to church at 6 o'clock. Did you know that church used to happen at night as well? <laughs> Sunday nights. Did anybody go to church Sunday nights? Okay, good. We're, we're going to start up a new service. You guys all have to come. It would be different, too. It's always weird. I kind of hassle my dad a lot. You know, he was my pastor growing up. And, and uh, you know, I'll hassle him about, you know, my time or whatever else. And he'll be like, man, I had to prepare three messages a week because they would do Sunday morning, Sunday night. And then we would also go back on Wednesday night. Did anybody go to Wednesday night church? Good. Wow. All right, and some of you heathens are just the Sunday morning people, and that's okay, too. We're all in the same boat now. But I grew up in this home, and it was infinitely being poured into me, and I never had to question anything until I started getting older, and all of a sudden I had to start questioning things because more and more information was coming in. And the older you get, the more information that comes in. When you're 10 years old and your parents are pouring this information, you're not really getting it from anywhere else. You're getting it from where your parents tell you you're going to get it from. And then the older you get, more and more information starts coming in. It starts coming in from different angles. And the things that appeared to be givens are no longer givens in your life. For me, I was forced to make a decision on, on what I believe because I no longer had somebody telling me what was right and what was wrong. I'll be 35 in a couple weeks, and I still call my dad and I ask him questions. Am I surpassing his knowledge? Yeah, I am. Uh, am I more wise than him now? Yes, I am. <laughs> but I like to make him feel like he's contributing. <laughs> uh, don't tell him that. He'll be here in two weeks. Um, and then he'll correct me on everything. Faith is, is a big deal. And the barriers to our faith are very, very real. If you consider your faith and your relationship with God, you can probably pull out some of those barriers. The idea today is that we can engage in content that's, 
that's not offensive, that we wouldn't take offense in the content that, that we'll talk about. Um, the idea is that we gain a better understanding of our faith and a more uh, encouraging faith life. And that we may be potentially walk out of here with, with new tools for, for discussion. I heard a story of a, of a pastor and he had a son. And um, one day the son was playing out in the yard and, and his mom calls him in for, uh, for dinner. And the kid runs in, the mom tells him you need to go get washed up for dinner. And, and like most kids, the, the, the son refused and he was very irritated and he asked, why do I need to, to wash my hands, right? If you have kids, you probably understand this. My kids fight us on this all the time. I don't know why they like dirty hands, but... <laughs> This kid replies back to his mom, why do I need to wash my hands? The mom replies back to the son. She says, because your hands are covered in germs. The kid's very irritated and he storms off to the bathroom yelling, germs in Jesus, germs in Jesus. It's all I hear in this house and yet I've never seen either one of them. You don't get it. We don't see Jesus, right? We don't, we don't physically see this person. Really, our faith is, is exactly like that. Our faith is exactly like this concept of germs in Jesus. Faith is difficult. The book of Hebrews talks about faith 39 different times. In chapter 4, it says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Hebrews says that we have to hold firmly to our faith. There are two times that we need to hold firmly to something. A, when we want something, when we want to keep it. And B, when we have the potential of losing it. Right? So Hebrews says hold firmly to your faith. Why? Because we want our faith, but we also have the ability to lose our faith. He goes on in chapter 11 and says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't see. Faith in the Hebrew language translates to confidence. Hold firmly to this thing that we have because of Jesus. Because if you don't, you can lose it. But listen, faith is us having a confidence in something that we hope for. Faith is confidence. Confidence in what? It's in our hope, in the things that we hope for. My big goal for this morning is this, that we would walk out of here with a more confident faith. Amen. That we would walk out of this room with a more confident faith. My goal is that you would have a better understanding of faith for yourself. And, and my goal is that you'd have a better understanding of faith for the people that you come in contact with. Yeah. The people that you talk to. And the conversations and the dialogue that you have with the people in your life, at work, at home. Because you need to have an idea and an understanding of what the faith in your life looks like. Colossians chapter 4 says this, Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. We're talking about questioning, and Colossians says that you need to be full of grace so that you can, understand, or so that you can answer people that, that ask questions. The idea is that you have an understanding of faith for yourself, that you have an understanding of faith for the people that you come in contact with. Last week, I, I was walking through Target, and I think it was Tuesday, and um, it's weird because I went to Target four times on Tuesday. It, it was super embarrassing. I'm confident the people at Target know me really, really well. I don't know how often you go to Target. I go four times a day. So, so one of my instances at Target, I believe it was the third time, uh, I'm walking through Target, and these two guys are walking towards me, and, and as they get closer, I'm looking at this guy's t-shirt, and, and it was one of those old coexist shirts. Do you remember those where, where people would have bumper stickers or t-shirts, and it would say coexist, and, and the word was written out in all of the major symbols of, of various religions? Do you remember that? Yeah. I, I, I was walking through, and I see this shirt, and I thought to myself, uh, remember the days when people thought that? Remember the days when, when people could coexist together? And I thought, man, I kind of miss that. I kind of miss that. I, I might not agree with your stance. I might not agree with your religion. In fact, I might think your religion is, is completely backwards. But in today's society, we have moved away from, and even more so I feel in the last five or six years, we've moved away from this neutrality where we all can get along to more of a mode of hostility. Well, I might not agree with you, but, 
but I'm okay with you being here. You know, I'm okay interacting with you, and we can have a civilized conversation. But even in the last five years, we've moved away from that, and, and all of a sudden there's this hostility. We moved away from neutrality. And I think that the more confident we are in our faith, then the more our dialogue can maintain this, this same confidence so long as we are rooted and based in Scripture. That we can coexist so long as all of the information that we are intaking is intaken from here. Does that make sense? I want to come at today from two different angles. The first one is science, and the second one is faith. So let's start with science. If you have your notes, you can pull them out. Science, by today's standard, is the very thing that shuts down faith. In this conversation of science and faith, the science side of things generally assumes and believes that they shut down the side of faith. But I think the very opposite. In fact, I think that science supports my faith and what I believe to even greater lengths. Here's why. Number one, science and faith answer different questions and they use different methods. A lot of times we try and put these two things in the, ca in the same category, but, but the reality is that science asks uh, what and how and faith asks why and who. Do you follow? Science asks what and how, and faith asks who and why. Science cannot measure a primary cause. God being the, the creator of the universe is a primary cause. Science deals with secondary causes, things that we can touch, things that, that we can physically measure. We literally have the inability to measure God's worth or God's value because we can't touch God. He's a primary cause. It's why in, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says faith is the confidence of something that we hope for. Because I don't get to measure God's worth. I don't get to measure who he is. My hope is that there is a very real God in heaven. That there is a son who sits next to the father. My faith is the assurance that my hope is founded in something incredible. Here's number two. There is an improbability of random circumstances. There's an improbability of random circumstances. Let's get sciencey. Can we get sciencey for a minute? Did anybody just love science in school? Was that your, that your jam? Could three of you? Good. This is relevant. <laughs> oh, sorry, right side. Right side. I won't tell you my secrets. So there are 26 constants in our universe, and 26 things that have to happen, 26 things that have to occur for our universe to exist. If any of these things get out of line, our universe ceases to exist. Okay, that's the extent of science that I'm going to go into today. Okay, but there are 26 things that have to happen. Okay, remember, we're talking about the improbability of a random circumstance. 26 things are finely tuned to allow our universe to exist. One of the most famous atheists to ever live, his name was Antony Flew. He, 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 was, he was at one point the world's most famous atheist, and he fully believed that as science progressed, it would eventually prove the lack of of existence of God. That as science progressed, more and more and more would be revealed to prove that God did not exist. That evidence would become more abundant. However, through this, this very, very, very famous atheist life, through his research in biology and DNA and chemistry, this man came to this conclusion that the complexity and the virtual impossibility of all of this happening naturally was so incredibly impossible that he changed his mind. This man that devoted his life to proving the lack of existence of God eventually changed his mind because he said there is just no way that this could just happen. There's this new documentary on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Our Planet. Has anybody watched it? Good, we're going to watch it next Sunday um, at my house. You're all invited. Uh, there's this documentary, it's called Netflix, I, I believe it's eight episodes, and I, what is it? It's not called Netflix? It's not called Netflix. It's on Netflix. 
the right side threw me this morning, so. <laughs> They're making me address them and give them things. So there's this documentary on Netflix. It's called Our Planet. And it's this basic exploration of our world and, and the animals in it. Incredibly fascinating, incredibly beautifully shot, right? It just, it's one of those visually appealing things. And I was watching it the other day, and, and it's starting to describe this, this salt pan in Africa, this, this old dried up lake bed. And uh, it's completely saturated with salt. It's one of the harshest environments in the world. And Nothing lives there. Animals will make the trek across it. Sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. It's very, very wild. Completely dry, barren land. And about once every decade, it rains so heavily over this lake that it fills up with water. Once about every decade. And some unknown thing triggers thousands of flamingos to travel thousands of miles to feast on the algae sitting on top of the water and breed. And they plant their eggs in the mud, and then the eggs hatch, and the flamingos take off. Lake bed dries up, and it doesn't happen again for years. The improbability of random circumstances. There's another one that I was trying to explain this to Shana the other night, and I, I think she stopped listening. <laughs> I'm going to try again. Um... <laughs> So there's this flower, okay? And I told Shana this. She didn't know it. I'm low-key afraid of flowers. And <laughs> plants in general kind of scare me. I don't know why, but they do. Well, actually, I do know why. I'm about to tell you. They don't have brains, right? There's nothing inside of a plant that is thinking about anything. And yet there is this plant, and it opens up, and it, and it turns its leaves, and it forms a bowl, and the outside of the leaves are very, very slippery. And so these bees, or the, the plant is very slippery. So these bees will come and they'll try and climb up the plant. And eventually they'll get into it. And, and their, their goal in getting to this plant is the bees are trying to uh, mate. And they need the fragrance from the oil that this thing is producing. So, so the plant forms a bowl and there's this little hook at the top and it drops this oil down into the bowl. And it fills up the, the, the bowl with this oil. And the oil is very sticky. And eventually the bees will get into it and they'll bask in this oil because it's you know, fragrant to them, apparently. However, it's very sticky and they can't get out of the bowl. And I'm watching this documentary and I'm thinking, man, that plant is about to eat that bee. It gets better. So at the bottom of this bowl is this tunnel. And, and the bee is forced to try and squeeze through this tunnel at the bottom of the plant bowl. And as the bee is squeezing through the tunnel, the plant drops a little piece of pollen on the back of the bee. And the bee squeezes through and he flies off and he pollinates this, this flower. It's the wildest thing that I have ever seen in my life. I strongly suggest you watching it. Because I do not do an adequate job of explaining it. But let me tell you this, the improbability of, probability of random circumstances is the very thing that nudges our faith in the right direction. That how can this, this finely tuned system that we live in just happen naturally? The improbability is wild. It allows us to believe that maybe, maybe all of this is too intricate to be a coincidence. Here's the third thing. We have common narratives. When we're considering science and we're partnering it with, with uh, faith, we have to start asking ourselves how all of these societies that are completely disconnected all around our world have a very similar narrative. Could it potentially be that this, this, this grand narrative is true? That there is this one grand narrative that God put into play, and it's not only true in history, and it's not only embedded in history, but it's embedded into our hearts. That God built us with this common narrative. And it doesn't matter if our societies are disconnected. If we live here in Cowlitz County, Washington, or we live in some random remote village in Africa, that God, has, that God has built us and embedded us with a grand narrative. A grand narrative that he did something. That God finally tuned the system that we live in. Faith is a belief based on reason. I truly believe that. 
We don't have two opposing forces. We have two driving forces. It's just that, that one of them is supportive and one of them is crucial. We have two, uh, two driving forces and one of them is supportive of the other. So let's change gears. If science is the supportive one, it means that faith is the crucial one. Remember, Hebrews chapter 11 says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for, an assurance of what we don't see. God's word is our evidence of the things that we cannot see with our natural, physical eyes. It's our evidence of the things that we are incapable of quantifying with science. This faith that we're talking about is not this external thing, it's this internal thing where we have confidence in a God that we cannot see with our physical, natural eyes, but we know based on his word that he's real and that he is alive and that, that he promises these gifts to us. Faith is the lifestyle of the Christian. Habakkuk chapter 2 says, The just shall live by his faith. Romans chapter 1 says the just shall live by his faith. Galatians chapter 3 says the just shall live by his faith. Hebrews chapter 10 says the just shall live by his faith. There is this this common theme happening in Scripture. And the theme is that faith is the lifestyle of the Christian. And it's this faith that 2 Corinthians describes uh, as, it, it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. This faith is something that that we live out. It's a lifestyle, but we don't do it by sight. We don't do it by the things that we can measure, by the things that we can quantify. See, I don't need to see something to believe it. I have confidence in the very thing that I hope for. It is the standard, and it is the lifestyle of the Christian, of the believer. We don't live based on what we see. We live our lives based on what God has said and promised us in our word or in his word. And we govern and and we live out our actions accordingly. I heard a story of a man that would go to church every Sunday. And and every Sunday he would come in and he would find his seat and and, uh, he would save the seat next to him. Every single Sunday and every week, the ushers would walk up in their attempt to help people find seats, and they would ask him, you know, is this seat saved? And the man would always say, yeah, I'm saving this seat for my wife. The man would come in every Sunday, week after week, month after month, and, and he would sit down and he would save the seat next to him, and his wife would never show up. But every single Sunday, he would walk in and he would sit down and he would save this seat because he would say, my wife is coming. I'm saving the seat for my wife. Until months later, his wife showed up and sat in that seat. That's faith. Faith is the assurance of things that we hope for. It is a confidence for the things that I want to see unfold. This is the lifestyle of the Christian. And for us, it's very easy to live out this type of faith when, when our bills are paid and our health is up and, and our kids are obedient, our kids are following Jesus. We can live out this type of faith. It's extremely easy when we're in those seasons of life. It's way more difficult when we're not in those seasons of life because all of a sudden we're struggling and there's no way to quantify God. So what we do is rationalize God out of the picture because it appears as if God is not at work, that God is not at play in our life. There's no percentage of trust in God that that we can lean into. There's no percentage of God that, that we can hold on to or cling on to other than all or nothing. So when it appears as if nothing is happening in our life and God is not intervening in our life, we cling to this zero faith because it's all or nothing. The key for us is trying to figure out how to gain the assurance in something that we cannot see and something that we cannot feel and something that we cannot measure or quantify. But assurance is not something that that we pick up and set down at our leisure. Assurance is this this thing that is cultivated and it grows over time and it gets deeper and it gets stronger. So how do we get it? Here's number one. Assurance grows by repeated conflict. Assurance grows by repeated conflict. There's only one time in scripture that God says to test him. There's only one time in scripture where it says, test me. In Malachi chapter three, in in reference to tithing, God says to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and and see that I don't open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so many blessings on you. And then he says, test me on it. 
Bring in the whole tithe. And then test me and see that I don't just unload blessings on you. It's the one time in scripture that God says, test me. And yet for us, for us, uh, this repeated experiment that we live out in life prove God's power and goodness. I don't think that we have to consciously think, okay, I'm going to test God on this. Because remember, the only time that God says to test him is in the tithe. But I think that our repeated experiments prove that God is going to do what God says he's going to do. That God is who he says he is. Every time that we've been, we've been helped through something, every time we've been sick and we've been healed or, or we've been wounded and we've been healed, every time we've been beaten down and, and lifted up again, Every time we've given up hope and yet we've been carried through something. There are all these, these repeated experiments that prove the goodness of God. Amen. And these times are repeated in our life over and over and over again. It's basically like another log thrown on this fire of faith until we are completely sold out to God's capabilities and what he wants for our life. This process of life is designed to be difficult. James chapter 1 says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. The hard part is we rarely recognize the other side of the storm. We get to the other side of the storm, and rather than give credit where credit is due, we start to look ahead and think, what's the next storm that's coming? What's the next thing on the horizon? And we don't necessarily stop and celebrate what God has done or even recognize what God has done because what God has done has begun to produce something inside of us that's not supportive to our life. It's crucial to our life. Here's the second thing. You still with me? Amen. Assurance grows through spiritual repetition. <gasps> Romans chapter five says, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Faith grows when we exercise the muscle. We glory in our sufferings because it produces perseverance, and that perseverance builds character, and that character gives us hope. Hope in what? Hope that God is who he says he is. That God is going to do what he says he's going to do. That God is real. That all of this is real. That faith is real. That we have a father who gave his son 2,000 years ago to die on a cross to save me from myself. That's the hope that I have. That's the assurance that I have. Amen? Come on, I pray with you. Jesus, thank you so much.